I thought we could revisit the topic of email. I know Tom Rodden, way back at the start of Computer File, did a, a video overview of how email works, but I want to focus in on one bit which I find quite interesting, because I'm that sort of strange type of character, and that is how do we transmit things that aren't text through email? I mean, email was written at the time, it was created, I think, originally in the 70s, the sort of standards we're using now, to send what was predominantly going to be ASCII text, small amounts of text sent between two users on a Unix system. These days we'll email programs, zip files, and I want to look at how we encode things that aren't text to be sent over email. If you look in the specifications for email, you can go and find the RFC, RFC 822, for those who are interested, it's been updated by RFC 2822. If you look in that, it describes email as being a series of lines of text. And by lines of text, it means a run of ASCII characters Ideally, no more than 80 characters or so, they say. I think it's 78, they actually specify, followed by a carriage return and a line feed. But it does stipulate it cannot be more than 990 characters. So you've got to keep the lines relatively small. 80 columns is effectively what they're aiming for. In that. So it's a series of lines of text that are sent between two computer systems. Now it also says that those characters can only be ASCII codes between 1 and 127, so it's 7-bit ASCII, and you can't use carriage return or line feed except to mean the end of the line. So you can already see that we're limited in what we can send between email. We can send text, basically. Email is designed to send text. If we want to send anything else, we've got a problem. But of course, these days, we all email, if we use email, that is, uh, all sorts of things. We might send pictures, music files, programs, PDFs, all sorts of other things we might send in email. So I want to look at how we can sort of take any arbitrary binary file and encode it so we can send it in an email. So it sounds like some serious limitations if there's a 990 character limit. You know, it sounds more like an SMS message or a tweet. Well, the 990 was a limit on any one line. So you can have as many lines as you like. So you could have a, as long a message as you like. But you're right, it's sort of, it's very much in the sort of computer systems of the day, you, you may, may well be reading this on a teletype where it's being sent to a line printer and then you get to the edge of the sort of lined paper and you can't print any more characters anyway, so you're going to have to go onto another line. Or you're reading it on a sort of small display which can't display any more than about 80 characters anyway. So in some ways it wasn't that much of a limitation because you just have multiple lines, one after the other, for each line of the message you're wanting to send. And the machines that they were using couldn't display graphics that well either, most of them. They were sort of purely text-based machines or they encoded graphics using text characters, sort of slashes and things and other escape codes to display things. So it, it was a limitation, but it wasn't that much of a limitation given the, the computers that they were using at the time. Of course, though, now we want to send any sort of file and to do it. And it wasn't that long afterwards, as Tom says, there was a program called UUN code and a corresponding one called UUD code which would take any arbitrary binary file and convert it into a series of characters that would fit the spec that could be sent over email. UUN code worked, but it was very much a manual process. You could only, you'd have to find the ASCII soup, cut it out and feed it into the decoder program. So what happened in the late 90s is there was another standard proposed called MIME, Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions, which sort of came up with a, a slightly different way of doing it. It enables you to have different sections in the email that can be encoded in different ways. It'll explain what they're encoded. It'll explain what type of files there. Is it a sort of a, a, an image? Is it a, an, an audio file? What type of audio file? That sort of thing in there. But it still had to do the same sort of thing. It still had to take the binary data that represents the actual image or whatever it is we're trying to send. We'll use an image as an example and it has to convert it into a form that could still fit the old email standards. So we're going to have to take a series of bytes, one after the other, and effectively convert them into a series of characters that we can decode at the other end to produce the original file again. Let's suppose we want to send an image. So the first four bytes that we're going to want to send of that image are, well, obviously 42, 13, 10, and let's pick another number. Oh, let's go for 56. And that's only the beginning of a whole load of more bytes. But we said that we've only got the values 1 to 127 that we can send as part of an email. That's what the specification says. And also, some of those bytes have special meaning. So, for example, 13, the number 13 actually means 
if you think about an old typewriter, move the carriage from one end right back to the beginning so you can type from the left again. Line feed has the number 10 in the ASCII character set, means move down onto the next line. So carriage return, line feed, go on to the next line. So these values we can't just send. We need some way of taking these bytes and converting them into characters that we can send. Now, the trick that's used is to not think about them as bytes, as sort of decimal numbers, but to actually think about them as a series of eight bits, one after the other. So the number 42, that's represented in binary as 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. I'm doing this from memory, so I could well make a mistake, at which point Sean will correct me as I go. So 13 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. 10 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And 56 is 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. We get the picture. Rather than thinking about it as a series of bytes, 8-bit values, we just think about it as a, a stream of bits. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut this stream of bits up into a smaller chunk. So rather than cutting it up into 8 chunks that we started with, we'll cut it up into, say, 5-bit chunks or 6-bit chunks or whatever it is we decide is the best one to do to make that. So let's think about why that would work. Well, let's think about the characters that we've got to encode values. So what characters have we got that we can actually use? Well, we've got the letters A, B, C, through to Z. And if we think about that, that gives us 26 possible things. Could we use those 26 characters to encode things? Well, if we took five bits, that would require 32 characters. That's more than we can get in A to Z. But if we took four bits, we would find that we'd only need 16 possible values. 2 to the power of 4 is 16, so we've got 16 possible values in there, 0 through to 15. And we could encode each of those values using a different letter. Give 0a, 1b, 2c, and so on, until we've encoded all 16 possible values. So we could just do that. We could say, OK, let's take the first four bits that are here. 0, 0, 1, 0. They are, so that's 2. We would then write that down as C, and we could do the same for each of the subsequent chunks of four bits that were there. But there's a problem with doing that, in that actually, if you think about it, each byte of the message was eight bit long, and so actually what we'd end up doing is converting it to two characters. And so the file that we'd end up with would double in size. So doing it with just four bits, where we, while we can match that into the letters that we can send, ends up sort of producing a file that doubles in size. So perhaps not the best way to do it. So let's rethink things a bit. What about if we were to use 5-bit chunks? Well, 5-bit chunks, that has 32 possible values from 0 through to 31. But we've only got 26 letters in the alphabet. We've got A, B, C, and so on through to Z. So that's not enough letters to encode the actual values. But we've still got other values that we could use. So for example, we could follow the Z with 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and that would give us 32 possible values. So now we could go through the same thing, and we would take the first 5 bits, which in this case would give us the value of 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, which has the value of 5, and we would take the fifth letter of the alphabet as the first one of the message, which would be E. So we do that, and then we do the next 5 bits, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, which is what? 8. So we take the 8th letter of the alphabet, which is, Sean? H. H. And so now we've encoded 10 bits, which takes us into two characters. And we could then do the same for the next 5 bits. And we could do that and convert the whole message. And the advantage of doing that is that it will take up, it will take up more space. All these encoding systems are going to take up more space to send the message than if we could just send the raw 8-bit bytes across because well, we're, we're having to encode them into fewer values. So we're going to end up using more characters because we're encoding them into fewer values. We can't help that. So we could do it with five bits, but it's still a bit wasteful. We know we can't go up to seven bits. At seven bits, we would have to use all the possible ones we can send. And we know that some of them, like zero, we can't use because of the specification. 10 has to follow 13 according to the specification. So we couldn't send that. So actually, we haven't got enough with seven. So what they actually chose was to use 6 bits, which gives us 64 possible values. So the encoding system that was developed 
was called base64 because we take the bytes we want to use and encode them from 8 bits per symbol into 6 bits per symbol in a way that we can then convert them back. Now how do we do it? Well it's exactly the same technique as what we've looked at already. I'm just going to undo this. We're going to take chunks from the bytes that make up the message six bits at a time to form the characters we're going to need. So we're going to need to define 64 characters that we can use. So the way we do that, well we'll start off using the capital A through to capital Z. That gives us 26. We can also use lowercase a through to lowercase z. That gives us 52. And then we can use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. That gives us now 62 possible things. We need a couple of extra symbols that we can type. So when they develop the standard, they use plus, and they use the forward slash as well. And that gives us 64 possible values. So if we take six bit chunks of the bits that make up the message, when we concatenated them one after the other, we can then encode them into these symbols to form the characters that we can send over. So let's have a look at our message again and work out how we do that. Now because we've chosen six bits, three bytes, that's three times eight numbers of bits, will encode as four six-bit characters, four of these six-bit symbols we're using. So every three bytes of our message will become four bytes of the encoded version. So we can look at the three bytes that we've got at the beginning here, and we've got 42, 13, and 10 as the ones we're going to send. So we can take these bytes, and we first of all need to sort of group them in the same order, both at the sending point and the receiving point, so we get the numbers in the right way. So the rules that are set forward for the base64 encoding is that the first byte becomes the most significant bit. So we'd write that one down first, 00101010. The next byte becomes the middle significant bits, for want of a better way of writing it. So that would be 00001101 in our message. And then finally, byte 3 would become the least significant bit. So we're mapping these into a 24-bit number. And now we start breaking that down into 6-bit chunks, and then we can convert them into the characters in what's effectively our lookup table that we've generated before. A, B, C, D, E, etc. to capital Z, A, B, C, lowercase through to lowercase Z, the numbers, and so on. So let's take the first 6 bits. We always start from the most significant point. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 is 10. So we want the tenth letter of our sequence. Now we start with A being 0. So the tenth symbol would be K, I think. So we take the first six bits and we can map them into a character. We map them into the capital K there. We now do for the next six bits. So the next one is 32, which is the lowercase g. So we now take the next six. Well, that's going to be 52. So the 52nd should be 0. And then we do it for the final set of six bits, which happen to be 10 again. So that becomes the capital K that we had at the beginning. So the first three bytes that we encode, which were 42, 13, 10, they were the numbers that made up those bytes in the file that we created, would encode as K, lowercase g, 0, capital K. We could then convert them for the next three bytes, and that would become another series of four characters. We do the next three bytes after that, would give us another series of four characters, and we could keep going through that until we'd come to the end of the binary file that we we're wanting to send. But there is a slight wrinkle here, because our binary file might not be an exact multiple of three bytes long. It might be sort of four bytes, or it might be 902 bytes long. So it might not be a multiple of three. And so we need some way to encode that. And the way that we do that is that we use an extra symbol to say that. So at the end, if we are encoding, say, two bytes, we encode those two bytes using the same thing. We pad it with zeros at the end. And then we write an equals character to say, only use two bytes of this. And if we're only encoding one extra byte at the end, we use two equals characters to say they're only encoding one extra byte. And so by this technique, we can take the message and convert every three bytes of it into four characters that we can send over email. And actually this technique has been used in lots of other places where you'll need to encode binary data into a character-based form that can be then sent. And at the other end, you just do the reverse. Our message here, we'd have K as the first set of six bits. So we would look that up 
in the table, we'd see that that's the tenth value, so we'd write down the 6-bit value for k for 10, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. We do the same for g, which is 32. We do the same for 0, and of course I can see the values already on screen here. And we would do the same for 10, of course, which we did at the beginning, so we get 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So we get that string of bits, making up our 24 bits, and then we would partition that up into 8. We take the top most significant 8 bits, and we get the binary value, which of course is our original message 42. And then we take the next 8 bits, which would give us the binary value for 13. And we take the final 8 bits of that 24 bit number, the least significant bits, which would give us the third byte, which would be the binary value of 10. So whenever we send a binary file, what your computer has to do is to take the bytes of that binary file, split it up into a series of bits, in this case we're using six bits, and then map those six bits to a particular character in the encoding so that we can then send it. It makes the file slightly bigger, in this case it's going to increase by about a third in size as you do it each time you encode it, but it does mean that we can send it over the network, send it over as an email or any other system which makes use of this. People have tried other systems which don't increase the size of the messenger much. PDF, for example, initially they tried to design that in a way that it could just be sent over email without needing to be encoded or certainly not needing UU encoding it at, at all. Um, so they use what they called ASCII 85. And what ASCII 85 does, it shows 85 characters that, from the symbols that would supposedly be transmittable over email without needing to be converted. So they used A through Z, lowercase and uppercase, as before, they would use the numbers and a few other symbols so they could get up to the 85. And you would do exactly the same thing, although this time it was done around powers of 85, I think. Um, so you raise numbers and things. It was a slightly more complicated system. Uh, it worked and you could encode things, but the trouble they found was that not all systems that were transmitting email at that time, in the early 90s, used ASCII to encode things. And I think there was a problem that it was sent through some email systems that were running on IBM systems using EBCDIC, if I remember right. And certainly the characters wouldn't be encoded properly in the EBCDIC version or whatever it was that it was used. So as it was sent through those email systems, the file would get corrupted. And so in the end, people just were starting to UU encode it or MIME encode it using Base64 anyway. And so it sort of fell out of fashion being used in PDF. So there's various other techniques you can use. But Base64 has very much become the sort of standard now, if you want to take some binary data and encode it into a form that it can be sent over something that only supports ASCII, Base64 encoding is the way that you do it. So they developed a system called MIME, which is a multimedia extension, and MIME then signals that inside this... We've got all our five songs in, and then we've got five clips of just the song recorded through a microphone. Uh,